Kisi. Why don't you put your hands together as Pastor yeah. Russell comes and brings the morning word. Thank you. Hey, worship team, thanks heaps. Great job, as usual. Well done, thank you very much. You cannot be seated. For those of you who don't know, I missed that. <laughs> Ali thought it was funny. You need to go on your honeymoon for a bit longer, mate. There you go. Good to have you guys back. Really is. And uh, Nikki is uh, away. And uh, I dressed myself again this morning, last iron shirt. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, Nick, Nick is away for a little while. She's taken her, her mum, who's 87, um, to England. Who's in, she is English. Um, and her, she has a brother who uh, is not long for this life. And she's also got numbers of friends in England. So um, Nikki and her sister have both taken her over to go and um, say some goodbyes and travel around. So it'll be a great trip, but also a, a very emotional trip. And uh, but I said, Nick, if you can go and do that, you go and do that. So it's a wonderful thing. So, so I'm holding the fort and uh, I'm bearing up. I'm not doing too bad. I am a big sook. I am a big sook. I am missing her a lot. Um, so just a couple of reminders uh, also. Uh, don't forget we've got our volunteers dinner coming up. It's only, it's only a little way off, 7th of no November. That's only not this Monday, Monday after. So if you're on a team, like, all you have to do is register. We have a great night plan at um, GBUN RSL. Uh, we've got our own room and we've got great food and just a great night plan, great theme. All you need to do is dress up and show up if you're on a team. So please make sure you register for that so we can give them numbers. And also, just an announcement I do need to make this morning, that is we have our AGM coming up on the 20th of November. I'm um, just letting you know. Yeah, well, it's an exciting announcement, isn't it? People get excited about AGMs. <laughs> and that will be at Tigham. We'll actually hold that at our Tigham facility uh, and it'll start at 12.30. And um, that'll, we'll give you some food and we'll have our meeting. Wonderful. Well, we're going to start a new series this morning. I hope you enjoyed Strong Bonds. I certainly got so much out of it. And uh, I love the book of Ephesians. And uh, I kind of got stuck in there a little bit. And so we've got another series coming out of Ephesians. Um, if you look at my Bible, you'll see that that's the page that falls out. Um, I tend to... So we're going to start a new series this morning called Spirit of Strength. Spirit of Strength. If you would remember back, our theme for this year is the theme of Strengthen. Uh, that God wants to strengthen us as a church. He wants to strengthen you. And so that's been the theme throughout the year. And I'm absolutely excited about teaching this series that we're going to start this morning. Because I believe absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, over the next few weeks, God is going to strengthen you. You're going to find strength that you didn't have before. And uh, you're going to Come, it's going to come out of the Word of God. You'll be pleased about that. It's not out of the Quran this morning. Uh, I'm preaching out of the Bible. And, uh, and the Word of God, faith comes by hearing the Word. Have you know that's true? And so faith is going to grow in your hearts, and we're going to take time. We're going to be praying for people, and I know that God is going to strengthen you. So we're going to start this morning with the passage of Scripture and then our key verse. We're going to go to Ephesians and chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 14 through to 20. Are you ready? This is Paul, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven on earth derives its name. I pray that out excuse me, of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. 
and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask, or more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And I'm going to read verse 21 just to finish off. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a great passage of scripture. Now, key verse is verse 16, which says, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So some few observations and a little bit of context just to get us started today and a bit of a foundation for the next few weeks. Paul starts off this little paragraph that I read this verse in verse 14. It says, for this reason, for this reason. So that obviously means he's coming back to something that he was talking about previously. And so what he's been talking about in the segment leading up to this prayer that he prays, because that's what it is, it's a prayer, he's praying it for the church in Ephesus, uh, is he's, he's talking about how amazing it is that God used him to reveal the gospel and the grace of God to the Gentiles. To the, Ephesus was in what is now modern day Turkey. Um, and so it was mainly to, to Gentile people, non-Jewish people. And so Paul is talking about how amazing it is. In fact, in verse three, uh, sorry, in, ch- in verse eight, a few verses earlier, it says, um, he says, "Although I am less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ." So Paul is talking. That's what he's been talking about. What an amazing thing it is that God had used him to speak about the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. And then this drives him then to pray for them. He's been talking about the gospel. He's been talking about the unsearchable riches of God. And then no sooner has he, sto- has he finished talking about it, it, then his next thing is it drives him to then to pray for them. He prays for them. And I want you firstly to notice what he doesn't pray. I think it's important to point this out. He doesn't pray for jobs or food or their marriages or, you know, it's like Pastor Paul, like he's a little out of touch, he's a little uncaring. No, he actually, uh, he's, he's, I want you to notice he doesn't pray for their circumstances. He doesn't pray for the outer man. Uh, They lived in times where there was great needs. There was a very high infant mortality rate. Um, So no doubt there were people in that church that had probably lost children. Um, There was a lot of sickness. Uh, Leprosy was a well-known disease at the time. There was a lot of hardship. As Christians, they were experiencing hardship because of the decision to follow Christ. They were experiencing hardship. They were living in a time where there was a lot of opposition to them personally, but it was also a time of a lot of conflicts. And yet, Paul doesn't pray for them for their protection or for their health or their for safe or their safety or, as I said, for provision or all these other things. His prayer has nothing to do with the circumstances in which they find themselves. Now, that's interesting to me. Because if you ask me to pray for you this morning, and we do that, we pray for needs, and it's not wrong to pray for needs, but this is not the main thing that Paul is focused on this morning. He doesn't pray for their outer circumstances. Why? And the answer is this, is because if you have the thing that he's praying for, if you have the Spirit of God strengthening your inner man, if you know the love of God in your heart, if you know those things, you will be able to handle any circumstance of life. Any circumstance of life. This is more important than that. The inner is more important than the outer. The inner man is more important than the outer man. And that's a key point this morning because Paul prays that God would strengthen them by his spirit in their where? In a man. 
See, we get preoccupied with the outer man. We get preoccupied with where we live, what we have, what we do, what we earn, how we look, our identity. But it's only in our inner man that these things actually find their place and their real significance. We're reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. I know, I know. For some of you, it's become your life verse. Outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You know, I'm, I'm reaching an age where I actually think I've peaked. Or close. I must be close. I, I ride a push bike, as you know, and I've, I've noticed that some of my times and my average speeds are actually starting to drop. Can you believe that? I think I may be just past my peak. Just. Uh, in fact, I, I had an incident the other day. I was actually I walk, I, I was walking past a mirror and I saw my father in the mirror and I thought what's my father doing in the mirror anyway any of you know what I'm talking about maybe you saw your mother in the mirror I don't know but it's like what's going on the outer the outer is in fact about three months ago I actually I uh I fell over I was working out the front of my, uh, my front steps and as I stepped over, I don't know what I did, but I rolled my ankle and in a split second I, was, I landed whack on my shoulder. And so I t- said that to someone and they said, no, 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 you didn't fall over. At your age, you had a fall. <laughs> I'm still in the falling over stage, not having a fall stage, all right? Anyway, you get what I'm saying. (laughs) And so it continues. But there's these two lines, diverging, diverging? Separating lines. Outwardly, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. We're being renewed. Is anyone here glad that they're, even though they're outwardly wasting away, that inwardly you're being renewed day by day? The inner man is more important than the outer man. There's something living inside of you. There's a strength that's coming inside of you. Listen to what, I love what D.L. Moody said. D.L. Moody's a great old preacher of a past year. He said, one day you'll read in the newspaper that D.L. Moody is dead, but do not believe it for a moment because on that day I'll be more alive than I have ever been. It continues right through life right into eternity being renewed and so Paul is praying for the inner man in verse 16 he talks about being renewed in your inner being in verse 17 he says so that Christ may dwell in your hearts it's the center of your life the core of who you are. In fact, it's pretty cool these days to strengthen the core. It's because what we've got to do, you've got to strengthen the core. How do we know we could all do with some core strengthening today? Being strengthened at our core in the inner man. Because this is where the Holy Spirit wants to strengthen you. Who wants that this morning? Another observation. Why is Paul praying this? <clears throat> Why? It's actually a little bit of a mystery because he's, he's writing this to believers. In fact, he starts off his letter to Ephesians and he says, to the saints. They don't get any more believing than saints, right? To the saints in Ephesus. They were people who believed in Jesus. They were Christians. And so the, Paul is writing to the saints. And then in verse 17, we've just read it. He says, um, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Well, Christ already, he early, he spent the first part, chapter 1 and chapter 2, talking about the way Christ, what Christ has done in the hearts and lives of the believers. So in in chapter 2, he talks about the fact that Christ is already dwelling in them. 
In verse 19, he talks about um, knowing his love that passes knowledge. But in, ver- in chapter 1, he's already talked about the fact that um, God has adopted them because of his love for them. He's already, they already know and have encountered the love of God. They've received, they've, they've believed in the love of God. Um, and then in verse 19, he's talking about being filled to the full measure of God. Well, in chapter 1, he's already talked about being blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So he's asking and praying for something that it would appear has already happened. That's kind of a, that's kind of a conundrum. Why would he be asking God to give them what they already have? That's a fair question, isn't it? Well, there's only one answer. They had those things, but they had not become a living reality in their inner being. This is so in line with what Keith said this morning about, you know, so often we don't feel like, we feel like, we know about God and we know these things, but we don't feel close to God. It's like it hasn't become a living reality in our hearts. Did you know it's possible to have something and yet not truly experience it? To believe and accept with your mind and reason, but not experienced in your heart to the degree that it's a living reality, that it's become a new way of living, that it affects the way that you walk and you think and you act and your, and your, and your decisions that you make. It's become a new way of living. It's possible to even just kind of live, let's call it creedal Christianity. We believe in the creed. We, you know, we, we live out, I know it's almost like we, we know something with our head. We can almost live life like we're phonies. We feel it like we're phonies at times or there's a sense of inauthenticity about us. We say these things yet we don't kind of really, there's not that connection down here in our inner being. Maybe there's a little bit of hollowness. And see the things that they knew and believed had in principle and, and had in principle is not something that they had experienced in their inner being, in their heart. And without that, you will not live a life of power. It's got to become a living reality in our inner being. So what does that mean? What does that even mean? Sure, I, I believe that, but what does it mean? What does it mean to be strengthened by the Spirit in your inner man. Well, I've done my best this morning to be true to the scriptures and and let it instruct us today. You see, in a Pentecostal church, we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and strengthening. We will straight away think about single transforming moments. You know, encounters with God, a, a living encounter kind of like an inward explosion that sort of happens in a moment and in our life we might have one of those we might have a few of those we might still be waiting for one of those and sort of those kind of experiences kind of carry us through life if you like now I want to say to you this morning I believe in God encounters I believe in Holy Spirit encounters I can't deny my I'm I'm thankful for the times when I've had a, a, a Holy Spirit encounter so I believe in those and we're going to be praying for those we're we're believing for those but that's not what this is talking about see even if you've had that encounter I want you to know that it doesn't end there rather there's an ongoing strengthening that takes place. So here's the thing. Rather than talking about a, what did I call it? Um, An inward explosion, a single moment. This is talking about an ongoing strengthening. The Holy Spirit strengthening your inner being. It's not just a momentary thing. But it's an ongoing strengthening that happens throughout your Christian walk. We find 
what that means in the next verse, in verse 17, we get a clue as to what that may mean. Verse 17, it says this, it says, so that, pray that this, um, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And the word dwell means to have permanently, to have permanency, um, to inhabit fully, that Christ may dwell in your heart. We've got, uh, I've got a unit under our house at home. Um, it's a nice unit. The house is more than three feet off the ground and we don't just stick someone. No, it's a proper unit we have under our house. And I recently rented that out to a, a new tenant. His name's Andy. So Andy moved in, and so I invited him into our house, if you like. So, but his, he, his place was in the unit downstairs. So Andy's living in the unit downstairs. Now, can you imagine if I come home today after church and discover that he's suddenly moved? He's not just in the unit downstairs, but he's come up and he's actually moved himself into the whole house. And throughout the week, I start to notice that Man, I find his stuff in my bathroom. He's leaving his, leaving his toothpaste in my bathroom. And he's, I, I go down to sit down in the evening to watch TV and find that he's, he's in the lounge room and he's watching telly with me. What's going on? Then I discover he's been looking through my fridge, wondering what, you know, he's checking out my diet. And blow me did I go to bed and he's in my bedroom. I mean, are you... He... He is fully inhabiting our house. You get the picture. You see, when you invite Jesus into your heart, it's like, Jesus, I believe in you. I invite you into my my house. In fact, I'll let you, in fact, you can have a cottage in the corner. Or maybe it's like, maybe, maybe a cottage is even, maybe it's like you can have a tent. Because if you get in the way, I can just move the tent. You just kind of move the tent around and you've got your little bit. You get the picture. But for Christ to dwell in our hearts, it means that no longer is he just in a little space in my heart, but he has fully inhabited. He has permanently filled and positioned himself because I'll tell you what, he's turned, he's turned the little cottage, if you like, into a palace fit for a king because that's what he is. He's the Lord. And he takes up residence and he finds space in every part and every dimension of my life. Who can see that? And so that's what the Holy Spirit does. It powerfully comes into our life and through the work, the ongoing work, the ongoing strengthening of the Holy Spirit, he, he transforms our life. He transforms us. Christ, and, and how does he transform us? That Christ is formed within us by his spirit. Can you catch this? In Galatians 4.19, there's lots of scriptures I could pick. But in Galatians 4.19, it says, My dear children, from whom I'm, I'm, in childbirth, I'm in pains of childbirth until Christ is what? Formed in you. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He works in your life so that the image of Christ can be formed in your inner man. So what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, in in two words, spiritual sensitivity. Spiritual sensitivity. The Holy Spirit prepares, this is what he does, He prepares your inner being. He sensitizes your heart to grasp more of Christ. It's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes your heart sensitive and enables you to grasp more of Christ. In fact, in in verse 18, listen to what it says. It says, May, that you may have the power together with all the saints to grasp, everyone say grasp, to grasp how wide and long, high and deep is the love of Christ. Grasp. 
To grasp something is different to believe something. You can believe something without grasping it. Does that make sense? To grasp means to get a grip or a hold of something. Who remembers back in the days of photography that we actually had a thing called a film? Or as my mum mother used to say, a film. You had film and you had paper and you'd get the prints and they would make... Who, who remembers those days? It's not that long ago, but wow. And so... The way the photography would work is that the paper would be sensitized by chemicals to light. And because the paper has been sensitized to light by the chemicals, it grips the image. So the shutter opens, the light comes in, and because it's been sensitized to the light, the image of the tree or whatever it is, is gripped. Is that right? But without that sensitizing, without the treatment from those chemicals, the paper couldn't grip, couldn't grasp the image that has been projected upon it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It sensitizes us. It sensitizes our heart that when there's an opening and light comes in, the Word of God is preached or we read some scripture or, or, or we listen to a sermon, light comes in and if it's not being sensitized by the Holy Spirit, it's like it shuts again, it's like the shutters open and shut but there's no grasping of the image. But when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and He's sensitizing your heart, well then light comes in, the gospel comes in, the Word of God comes in, a message is preached, you hear something, you read something and that imprints, the image is grasped, it's gripped inside of you and it becomes something that's alive and living. Who can see that? That's what it means to have the Holy Spirit strengthening you in your inner man. The image is captured. And of course, when I'm talking about the image is captured, whose image am I talking about? I'm talking about the image of Christ. And that's what I mean when I say the Holy Spirit sensitizes our heart that we can then become more like Christ. And it becomes real to us. It becomes living to us. And it becomes a new reality in your life. I guess the only other thing that I could put it would be, or the only way I could explain it is, it's like you tell someone about honey and you can tell them that honey is incredibly sweet and they can believe you that honey is incredibly sweet. And they would argue with someone else and say that no, honey is incredibly, honey sweet. And they can know it in their mind, but you still never tasted it. And then one day, you actually taste it. And suddenly, you will say, I knew that honey was sweet, but now I actually know that honey's is sweet. Are you hearing the difference this morning? And so when the Holy Spirit, you can hear Christian truth. You can hear the truth of the gospel. You can hear about God's love for you. You can hear about God's grace for you. And you can believe that. And you can say, yes, I believe that. You can tell other people about that. But then suddenly, because the Holy Spirit begins to make that image, sorry, make your heart sensitized to the things and the truth of God, suddenly it grips you and it becomes a living experience for you. And that's why Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and even though they've believed it and they accepted a lot of things and in a sense they had it, Paul's heart cry was that it would go from here to here, that the Holy Spirit would so sensitize them that they would become alive to the things of God in their inner man because it's only then that we know the strength and the power of God at work in our life. And I, I know it's, it's uh, there's, you know, Keith touched on it this morning. There's so often so many of us, we know things in our mind and we, will, we would argue the case with someone else that this is true. 
but something inside of us doesn't quite at times match with what we espouse and what we know that we believe. And so Paul is praying that the church in Ephesus, and this morning he's praying for you and I, that we would not just know with our heads, but it would grip our hearts. And that that truth of who God is and, and who Jesus is will grip our hearts and it will become an experience that changes us every day. It's a little bit more than just a one-off momentary experience. It's an ongoing strength, strengthening. People have told me that God is gracious. I believe God is gracious. I have an opinion that God is gracious. It's possible to have an opinion that God is gracious, but not actually have a sense of it in your actual heart. I hear it said all the time, I believe it, I know it. Well, this morning, the Holy Spirit wants that to become alive to you. He wants that to become alive to you. Because it only has power in your life when it becomes alive to you down here. And the Holy Spirit wants to sensitize your heart this morning. That you can not just know it, but you can know it. I know God is loving. I'm told he's loving. I'll tell anyone that God is loving. But I'm still not sure that God loves me. I have days when I wonder if God loves me. It hasn't gripped your heart. It hasn't gripped you in your inner being. And the Holy Spirit sensitizes you that so that Jesus loves becomes love becomes real to you becomes so real the, the image of Christ gets gripped inside of you it becomes the image is formed inside of you it becomes so real that his approval and his love listen to me carefully and his opinion becomes more assuring and important to you than, a, than any other human being on planet earth more than a peer or a friend or even your family Oh, I know Christ loves me, but this person has rejected me and criticized me or failed me, and now I'm devastated. Well, of course we feel that, but the devastation is only because you know, but you don't know the love of God because it hasn't gripped your heart. Are you hearing me this morning? That's where the strength comes from knowing that until then we live powerless lives. But when you know the love of God, it's gripped you. Listen, it, it, when you know, when, when, the, when the love of God, and it's, and it's not just something that'll happen, it'll unfold over your life and the love of God will become more and more real to you throughout the different circumstances of your life. But as, as you go through your Christian life and the Holy Spirit reveals more and more and the love of God becomes more and more real and I suddenly have a, a greater revelation and understanding, it becomes from here to here. Let me tell you, I'm going to become, it's going to start to change the way I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be less needy as a person. I'm going to be less afraid. I'm going to be less selfish and self-centered. I'm going to be less proud. I've been permanently changed. Why? Because the love of God has become real to me. It's no longer just, yeah, yeah, God loves me. Everyone tells me that. But it becomes real. So there's basically two things that Paul prays for. He prays strengthening you by the Spirit, strengthening Spiritual sensitivity, thank you. He's praying for that. He's praying for you to become spiritually sensitive, that the Holy Spirit would strengthen you. And then he prays that you would know the unlimited love of God. Can you imagine if you just know those two things, that the Holy Spirit is strengthening you, it's working in you, it's sensitizing you to the truth of who God is. And you, the revelation of that is unfolding. Do you imagine the impact that has on your life? 
Can you imagine the power and the strength that that starts to have in your life? And then, then, he, then, then you start to begin to see and understand how much God actually really does love you. That's got those two things, just, man, that's going to take you through life. You'll be able to walk through anything if you know those two things. And that's why it was Paul's prayer. I don't, Christian people, saints, I don't want you just to know it up here, but I want you to experience it and have encountered it in your heart and in your life. That's a pretty weak clap, everybody, but that's all right. Don't, you're not clapping me, you're clapping the Word of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? I think they sh- this, this can direct us as to how we pray. Get the list out and start praying for the church. You start praying for all the different... No, no, no. I like what Paul does. He prays that they would know spiritual strength in the inner man. And that they would grasp the love of God. That's my prayer for you this morning. That's my prayer for me. It's my prayer for my family. It's my prayer for people. That we become so sensitized by the Holy Spirit that when those moments, the light comes in, the image is firmly gripped, we grasp it. Our heart and our life becomes filled with strengthening the inner man. Who can see this takes this way beyond religion into a living, vibrant, powerful, strong relationship with God? Boy, we need that. We need that, church. I need that so much. And there's an incredible resource available to you and I today. Listen back to the verse, verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious Riches, that's, that's the resource, his glorious riches. His glorious riches. Out of his glorious riches. That's the resource. That he may strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit. That's the agency. He's got the resource. And the Holy Spirit is the agency that brings it. And the location is into our inner man. But there's a, there's a, think about that, the riches of his glory. Think, just think upon that for a moment. There's, just, just imagine if you've received an inheritance, an amazing inheritance, and you, you put it in the bank, and you know, you know it, it's there. You know that it exists. You know that it's real. But years later, you fall upon incredible financial difficulties. And you've got loads in the bank. You've got a massive inheritance, but you're living poor. Brother and sister. And I say that intentionally. My brothers and my sisters. We can go through life knowing that there's all this, but living poor. And there's so much more to come. There's more. We have the Holy Spirit and he wants to make Christ real to us this morning. His riches. Think of the riches of his love, his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his trustworthiness, his provision. Let it grip you this morning. Come on, just put your notes aside for a moment. Let me read to you as we close this morning, verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Who believes that this morning? Come on, let's take a moment. Let's just present ourselves before God for a moment. And I guess I would say to you this morning, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself to him again this morning. Don't, you can have been a Christian for years, knowing so much of this stuff in your head, but it's never gripped your heart. The grace of God, the love of God. 
This is my prayer this morning. This is why I believe over the next few weeks as we talk about the strengthening, the spirit strength, there's going to be an ongoing strengthening that takes place in your life. Let's take a moment. Let's pray for two things this morning. Let's pray for spirit strength. Who needs that this morning? Spirit strength, come. Sensitize my heart. Come on, that's what we're going to pray for. Just where you are. Just between you and God for a moment. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We pray this morning for spirit strength to come. Just like Paul prayed that we would be strengthened by your spirit in our inner man, that our inner man would become alive and sensitive to who you are. Father, today that we would grasp, we will have taken a hold of the image of Christ, that would have been shed abroad in our heart and life today and we would not just know it, but we would know it. Father, help us to meditate upon that. Help us to, Lord, for that word to become life to us today. Father, I'm praying today that we would also know and grasp the love of God. Father, to we wouldn't just know it in our heads, but we would know it in our heart. Father, we ask today, I ask on behalf of us all, and I include myself in that prayer, Father, that that which we know in our head, would we would know in our heart. Lord, like Paul of old, praying for the saints who already knew and had those things, Father, that they would become alive and real in their inner man. Lord, there'd be an unfolding revelation of who Jesus is in our life, I pray. We ask this, Father. So Holy Spirit, come. So Holy Spirit, come. Come on, let's just stand for a moment. Let's just reach out to Him this morning. Put your own words to your prayer. Just let your own, take a moment, let's let your own heart cry. Be heard before God this morning. Oh, Holy Spirit, strengthen us in our inner being. Come, Holy Spirit, strengthen our inner being that we can see the image of Christ so clear, so real. Lord, we'd be people not just of knowledge, but of revelation, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, strengthen our inner being, we pray. That we may know the love of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on.
this morning, more than normal seems very personal for me today as well. <clears throat> and I know I need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I need, a, I need the Holy Spirit to do something new in my life. That I can see Jesus more clearly than I've seen him. That I can grasp his grace and his love and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness. Have I got any friends out there this morning? So, Father, I pray that your word would become life to us. Lord, that it would reap a great harvest in our life. It would make an incredible difference to us. Pray of these next <clears throat> few weeks, Spirit, that you would, you would strengthen us in Jesus' name. Before I close this morning, I talked a lot about your heart and inviting, you know, Jesus coming into our heart and our life. I wonder if there's someone here you've never opened your life and said, Jesus, I'm inviting you to come into my life. Because I tell you, if you do, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find, well, you're going to find forgiveness. You're going to find incredible forgiveness. That's why he died on the cross. Paid the penalty for all of our sin. That we can be completely 100% forgiven past, present, future. You're going to find a friend. It's not just about up here, but it's a relationship. You're going to find a friend. And you know what else? You're going to find a future. Future here for tomorrow, the week after, in your life, but also a future in eternity. I wonder if there's someone here you've never invited Jesus into your life. He says, he stands at the door of our heart and he knocks anyone, anyone, doesn't matter where you've come from or no matter what you've how far you think you are from God this morning, if you open the door of your heart and say, Jesus, come in, he'll come in. He'll come in. And you'll find forgiveness, a friend, and a future. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who you, Russell, that's me. I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to open the heart of my life and invite him in anybody. Last Sunday morning in Tigan, we had two people for the first time ask Jesus into their life. I opened up the heart. What a great day. Anyone here this morning wants to open their heart and say, yeah, that's me. I want to invite Jesus in. I want to be forgiven. I want to know him as my friend. I want to know that I have a, an eternal future. Anybody here? So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Help us to water it. Help it to spring up into all it can be. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're going to close in a few moments. We're going to um, just take a moment. Let me just mention offering to you this morning. And uh, <clears throat> what a wonderful thing it is to position ourselves in a place of blessing. You know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Oh, yeah, I know that. I know that. But has it become real to you? Has that gripped your heart? Has that become an experience in your life? Giving's a great way of knowing the love of God, the provision of God, and out of that security, that place that empowers and strengthens us to freely we've received and freely we give. Let me pray. Father, this morning we thank you this morning that we're able to position ourselves in the place of your blessing father we thank you that it says in your word that it is more blessed to give than to receive and so father this morning we come and we give father we thank you when we do that we reflect you and father we thank you that we put ourselves in a place where we say we trust you we trust you in our finances we trust you with provision and father today we I ask the blessing of God over that which is given over every giver. Lord, I pray that they would know the blessing of God and the provision of God, whether it comes out of their lack or their abundance. Bless this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many people give online and it's sort of a thing that happens. Others, you can do it on the way out if you like. So we're going to have a song and finish up and then in a moment, Keith is going to come and then and just close off the service. So guys... Over to you. Oh. We're going to end on 